As many of you know, last week, a group of seven or eight left here on Sunday. They drove to Woodbury, Tennessee. I'll show you where that's at in a minute. And they were at Bible camp from Sunday to Friday morning. I want to tell you a little bit about Bible camp tonight and tell you what we did, tell you how it started, tell you what it's looking like in the future. A man by the name of Dr. J.F. Adams in December of 1952 said in a sermon in which he was preaching at the Woodbury Church of Christ in Woodbury, Tennessee, this mountain is special. They were trying to raise the funds, trying to get people on board to start a Bible camp, a place where young minds could go, learn about God, separated from all the things of the world, Cut off from technology, a place where they can grow. There were 700 acres that were allotted for this camp to be built upon. It rests upon one of the highest points in Middle Tennessee, some 2,000 plus above sea level. There's a 360 degree view from everywhere in which you stand on top of that mountain. You can see... Tennessee. The first year of camp was in the summer of 1954, and it was only 10 days, and it was only for boys. They only had a few buildings on the premises at that time. In 1953, about 150 people from 20 congregations gathered together, and they decided this is what we're going to do. So they took a $5,000 loan from the Bank of Commerce in Woodbury, Tennessee, and they built the first few buildings. That first 10-day session was for boys only. They only had one bathhouse, and the bunks were in the mess hall. It was a short year. As it sits today, about 294 people can go every week for eight weeks. Each week is different. Each group of people doing things is different. And what I want us to do tonight is just highlight our week for a minute introduce you to what the place is, what it looks like, what you're going to be doing while you're there when you're at week one. We are week one of Short Mountain Bible Camp. On the screen is a picture. It was a Wednesday or Thursday. I think it was a Wednesday. Those days have now blurred together. And we gathered together right there in front of the mess hall. That's the red roof behind you. That's the mess hall. It's a front and back partitioned full commercial kitchen mess hall. So we gather the 100 campers in which we had registered on Sunday and the about 40 staff in which we had, except a few. Several of our counselors had to be in the kitchen at this moment preparing to serve the food. Several of ours, like Nathan Hale, was in the kitchen making sure everything was ready. Nathan and Jim and Tabitha, they didn't know I was going to say that, gave up an entire week, took vacation time. So they could give their entire week working. And I want to tell you, Jim and I got up at 7, and we went to bed at 1. Nathan got up at 5, and he stayed with us about every day, all day long. A lot was given, and that's just three or four of us. We had about 40 or 50 on staff. We have two counselors in every cabin, and we'll get to that in a minute. But people gave up a lot, and I was proud of them for doing that. So we had our nice little picture taken here, but let's move on. You can see where we're located down in the little square, about right there. There we are. That's 509 East Madison Street. I know you can't see us, but we're there right now. If you follow that little blue line, and I know that little blue line's hard to see. It's about 110 miles. You're going to make your way to Woodbury, Tennessee. And once you get there, you're going to find an entire facility built for Bible camp. The only part this land is used for, Bible camps, Bible retreats, Bible-related things. There are policies set in place 
to where if your weak does something that's not approved of Scripture, you won't do it again. Every safe measure that has been possible or has been seen to be needed has been put into place. The 700 acres of what's called Short Mountain begins when you get to the top. It begins lower, but what we use is all over. You'll notice you'll see this tiny little red dot right back there on the back side over here. That's about the entry point to the camp. And you can see as you're looking over on this section over here, you'll see a group of buildings there. You'll see what looks to be a small patch of sand. It is sand. And you keep on going out and you'll see a house in the field and you'll see more things over here by a pond. This is the main camp area. Most things happen here, but not everything does. Then there's the caretaker's house. The camp employs one man and his family. And his main prerogative and goal is to make sure that camp is up and running every day of the week, all year long. That's his job. It is the most important job on the mountain. Because if he didn't get everything running, there'd be no camp. There would not be eight weeks. As we're sitting here right now, week number two, which is Maury County, started at 1.30 with registration just as we did seven days ago. So he's back and forth, back and forth all summer long. In front of the house, I don't have a box on this, is the giant field. If you ever hear me mentioning the field, that's where we're talking about. We keep on going through here, the horse area. We do keep horses on the mountain um, for the kids to ride and for other various things. Then there's the pool and the pond area, in which we'll discuss in just a moment. Let's look at the girls' side of things. What we're going to do is just introduce you to the camp for a minute, and then we'll get into the spiritual application. As you're noticing this list... A lot of kids can stay here. Every cabin has a different name. The first one on the list is Cricket or Cedar. Then there's Cricket and looks like Cricket's on there twice. That was an accident. And you've got Locust, Magnolia left and right, Maple, Pine, and Walnut. Almost all of our cabins now have been updated and taken care of to where there's a bathroom in every cabin, where there's showers for multiple in every cabin. We go on to the guy's side, there's cabins like Bald Eagle, Black Hawk, Howling Wolf, Flying Squirrel, Rising Sun, Thunder Stick, and Fire Stick. Three of our guys, which was Connor, Trevin, and Bryce, were in Fire Stick all week. I'm trying to think. One else was in Cricket, I believe. I think that's right. Let's think about the capacity of everything else. We've got a cook's and nurse's cabin. And we're going to be talking about this soon. We may be having a service team project, I don't know if anybody knows that yet, of possibly working on the cook's cabin and the nurse's cabin. It needs some desperate attention, not a lot, but just a little bit of on-hands work. There's the Rains Dining Hall. Gail Rains, for many years, was the caretaker of the camp. He recently died of cancer. There's a Shannon Neely craft cabin. There's a basketball court covered, which has everything. We, on week one, do everything in the gym, and we'll show you more of that lately. And since we're already talking about people that don't know they're going to get talked about, Rock Cliff Church of Christ in McMinnville, Tennessee, called me a year ago and said, we have $2,500 for a sound system for camp. They mailed me a check. There are people that give thousands of dollars to make sure this camp survives. I can tell you of a congregation in the White County area that had to go take out a loan to make sure this camp had the money it needed to build a new project that it had going on. There's an outdoor baptistry, a pool, a lake with canoes, paddle boats and kayaks, and horseback riding with trails that are kept up each year. So far, that's just material things. That's just what it takes to get to the camp. If you're pulling in, and those of you that went, you'll remember this, this is the very bottom of the mountain. This is the beginning of your week. Your week really begins with this road. It's not the best road. It might scare some of you, but it's the only road up and the only road down, so you begin here. When you get to the beginning, you see the camp entrance. You see the nurses and cook's cabin here. If you look down the pass of that vehicle going this way, you can barely see a concrete post at the end. There's the entrance. You've made it to the entrance of camp. You keep on going, we have cabins like Cricket, and this is where one was staying this week. We keep on going, here's the gym, this is a steel metal structure. You can see the benches and everything set up in the middle. We do everything in this gym. We have all of our chapels in this gym. We have everything you can imagine. Just to fill you in on what the kids were doing biblically for the week, 
For 30 minutes in the morning, they had a morning devotional. For one hour every night, they had evening worship full of songs and prayers and scripture readings, both combined. Every day inside of their cabin, the counselors would be using material that was written for the specific week, and there were two one-hour Bible classes every day. So three and a half hours out of all the day in which they are there, or every day they are there, we dedicate to Bible study or Bible-related things, depending on what's going on. The gym, all sorts of things happen in the gym. Some weeks use different areas, some weeks use... Week one, we use the gym a lot. It's much easier to, to keep everything there. This is part of Boys Village. If you look on the right, or on the left, you're going to see Black Hawk, and at the very end, the one that's almost facing us, that's Bald Eagle. And if you look to the one on the right, that's a building that's now closed. All of the boys' cabins except Bald Eagle have their own bathroom and showers built in them, and Bald Eagle should be soon. We're working our way of closing that bathhouse out. It was one of the original structures. It needs some work, so we're working on getting rid of that. As we keep on going, there is the volleyball court. If you remember that aerial shot we looked at in the beginning, you could see that sand right there in front of the mess hall. If you were looking and you could look to the left, you would see the mess hall. If you look about where that boy in blue and the boy in orange on the other side of the net is, you'll see a round rock structure. That's a baptistry that sits in the middle of the camp. So we've got a baptistry there. We also use the pool for such things depending on what's going on there. And we'll talk about baptisms in a minute, but I will tell you one girl was baptized in the pool because that's where her mom was baptized about 30 years ago. So a lot of good things happen here. There's the rock wall in which has a flagpole. You'll hear us referring to the wall. We do all sorts of things in this area, and you can see the mess hall right to the left there. Every morning at about 8 o'clock, we'd line them up there. Every day at lunch and every day at dinner, we'd line up there so we can get everybody situated and on to lunch or dinner or anything else. Here's the craft cabin. This is one of the two newest structures. The bottom of this cabin also carries a guy's bunkhouse. We keep that one locked off for the week just for inclement weather. We have some storms. Even while we were up there, we had some storms. It didn't get bad enough to where we had to put them into a safe area, but that one's down in the ground far enough where if the storm came, everything would be okay. We did have a few storms, but nothing like in the past. We've used that once as an emergency shelter. There was only one time, and we were in the mid-July range before, where we actually put them in there and were actually concerned about what could have happened. But this year we got lucky, just had a lot of rain. Here are some of the kids, and I'm going to step away so I can look at these with you. We had 100 campers participating in this week. And this is where we're going to start developing into the spiritual side of the things that are happening. The top two pictures, one is Magnolia left, one is Magnolia right. Magnolia right should be the one on the left. Well, that got backwards, didn't it? Magnolia right's on the left, and Magnolia left's on the right. Cricket is right here in the front, and you'll notice a familiar face on the bottom left if you look real close in a red shirt. We've got another group, I believe this was Maple here. We've got one more girl's cabin taking a picture here, and we've, we failed to do something. We missed one girl's cabin. We couldn't find the picture of it today to put it in here. We've got one of our, we've got Thunderstick on the top, and if you notice in the bottom in red, gray, and black with his arms folded, somebody else that might be familiar, that would be Thunderstick, or Firestick on the bottom, Thunderstick on the top. That is the newest structure that sits on the building. It is a cabin built for boys, which can be also heated and cooled for the winter and contains its, its own self-contained, so it can be running. Say we wanted to have a retreat there in the winter. We would either use Magnolia or the new Thunderstick Firestick cabin combined to be able to do that. And that may be something we'd try to look at in our future of doing something like that on this premises. But we keep going. We've got our youngest cabin on the top, which was Flying Squirrel, and our oldest cabin on the bottom, which was Black Hawk. Now, each of those cabins we just mentioned, including the one that wasn't pictured, had two to three adults that gave up their entire week to teach these kids. Now, there was something interesting that happened in the Black Hawk cabin we've never had happen before. One of them, on his own, nobody told him to, nobody even asked him to. It hadn't even been mentioned. We didn't even talk about it. We never have talked about it. He asked two of the boys that were in his cabin, you want to study the Bible? 
two of the baptisms were from him. You know, I learned something this week from that young man. If we'll just say, do you want to talk about Jesus, maybe we'd have better results. He taught me something there, something we had never noticed before. But as we keep going, most of the cabins, this is just to get you a familiar look into what's happening here. Most of them look like this. The top right picture is the newest one. That is thunder stick on the top and fire stick sits below it. It is one of two safety shelters that are now built into the mountain. This was our staff, minus those that were cooking. I did notice today when I was putting this in here, our two nurses evaded us. Don't know how that happened. Are, are you in there? I didn't see you in there. Okay. I must not have good eyes. But we had a good staff. There were several there. This was one of our morning devos. This is the only devotional that happens outside of the gym. Normally we do this on Wednesday, but Wednesday it was so wet we couldn't get out there. We take them to the back of the caretaker's house. There is a wonderful overlook point. You can see most of Middle Tennessee right there. You go out there at night, you can see it all. So we have a daily devotional. This was, this was the 30-minute devotional, usually consisting of two songs, a prayer, a scripture reading, a devotional period, then another song and a closing prayer. And we would use various times throughout the day. We also have gym fun. We would put them in the gym each evening, and I'm going to talk to you about the schedule as well. Each evening between 8 and 9.30, we'd have them in the gym. And we'd have different various activities for them. You'll have to talk to some of the ones that were there to see what they enjoyed the most. My favorite was Hungry Hungry Hippos. But you'll have to ask them about how that went. I don't know how they thought about that. As we keep going, we had a water slide for them to participate in. We even make everybody participate. If you'll look and notice, one of those is me and one of those is not. Uh, the other director and I, we, we really try as hard as we can to make sure we're participating in any form that we can. And I'm going to explain that in just a minute of why we do that. We also ask all of our counselors. We even had our nurses and our cooks this year participating in ways we've never had. And I'll explain that in just a moment. As we keep going, here's the question we have to ask. What does this have to do with us? What in the world does all that have to do with us? From 7 a.m. to 10.30 p.m., there's a schedule. They wake up, 7.30. 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock is breakfast and cabin cleanup. We even grade their cabins on scores of how they cleaned. From 9 to 9.30, there's the morning devotional, morning activities from 9.30 to 10.45. At 11 o'clock, they have Bible class till 12. From 12 to 1, they have lunch. From 1 to 2, they have Bible class, and from 2 to 2.30, the most silent portion of the day, we have what's called feet on bedtime. Your feet have to be on your bed. We send them to free time from 2.30 to 5.30, in which they can go swimming, they can go to the water slide, they can do all sorts of things, horseback riding, they can go to the craft cabin if they want. It's up to them. They start to learn, to develop, to be independent, and we get to see that. When you see an 8-year-old boy decide he wants to go to the pool today, he gets there by himself. He's not left running on, off on his own, but he got himself ready, and we see that happening. At 5.30 to 6, there's a break. At 6 is dinner. 7 to 8 is evening service. 8 to 9.30 is evening activities. 9.30 to 10, the junior cabins are dismissed. And at 9.30, we do late night singing all the way to 10 p.m. From, Thursday, from Tuesday to Thursday, we let the oldest two cabins on both sides stay up till midnight. And that gets to become a long day. Jim and I were calculating it. Our longest day was 17 and a half hours. But we learned something from all of these kids, and that's what I want us to look at now. Why is this important? Before we do that, I do want to mention one other thing. There are a couple of copies of books. This is what they studying in their cabin. They would go through this. We use the theme heart and soil from the parable of the sower. This was the four themes of their Bible classes, and I do want to tell you about the devotionals too. The first was the wayside soil, so they had the lesson that was written for them. Then they would have an activity to go along with it to help reinforce it, the rocky soil, and you keep on going, the thorny soil, and then the good soil, and all sorts of things for them to be participating in. I have four of them. One of them's here. There are three right there. If you want a copy of that, I can email it to you. We just don't have any extra print versions available. I do want you to know what they studied in their devotionals as well. I meant to get this in there, but did not. 
On Monday, in the morning devotional, the topic was what the Master taught in his Sermon on the Mount. On Tuesday, what the Master taught in his conversion with Nicodemus. Wednesday, what the Master taught in his conflict with the Pharisees. Thursday, what the Master taught with his parable in the prodigal son. Sunday night, Jesus, a perfect man who taught parables for us. Monday night, Pharaoh, a man with a hard heart. Tuesday night, Simon the sorcerer, a man whose heart was almost rocky. Wednesday was Ananias and Sapphira, Christians with thorny hearts. And Thursday was Cornelius, a man with a good heart. We strive every time we go to Short Mountain to make sure everything is covered in the theme in which we're going. So if you want to get those books, you can. So let's answer the question. What does this have to do with any of us? What does this have to do with you? What does this have to do with me? What does this have to do with the future of God's kingdom? What does this have to do with the church? Why do I need to worry about it? Why Cam? Number one, teaching is our number one goal at Short Mountain. Yes, I know you saw some things like water slides. There was an obstacle course of a picture. There we've talked about a pool and a lake and horses. We could talk about a dunk tank. We had them. We could talk about the counselors participating. We had them do that. We could talk about the meals that they ate. And if you want to know about cooking meals, ask Nathan how long it takes to cook 30 pounds of hamburger meat for spaghetti. Or 30 pounds of hamburger meat to feed tacos. How long does it take to cook enough baked potatoes to have a baked potato bar for lunch? Nathan knows. What does that have to do with anything? For the week, not much. We had to be fed. And we appreciate our cook staff as much as we can. But teaching is the number one goal. I had Joel 1 verse 3 read for us as we began. Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and let their children tell another generation. I, I know that particular passage in its context is beginning a warning. We want these individuals to know. And I talked about the one boy who had talked the other two children about Jesus and talked to them in the same cabin, the oldest two boys. He started when he was eight. When he was 18, he was talking to fellow campers about becoming a Christian. And, and that's why we want, we, I chose Joel 1-3. Tell your children of it. And let your children tell their children. And, and let them chil children tell another generation. Camp doesn't have to exist. But it does. Similarly, the psalmist admonished his generation to teach the children the law of the Lord in Psalm 78, 1 through 8. He used three different phrases in that particular psalm. Number one, to set their hope in God. Number two, so they would not forget the law or forget the works of God. And number three, so they would keep his commandments. If anything, that's what we want. The fun things, they're great. The food, it's always great. The facilities are always maintained. But the Bible classes... At the Bible study. Let me tell you something else that we've never had happen before. It was Tuesday night. First night, the oldest cabin was able to stay out. Derek and I try to wrangle them in as we can and keep them quiet away from the other kids who are trying to go to sleep. So we decided to get them out of the gym and get them in the volleyball court area. So we made everybody leave the gym. Didn't realize what was happening. At one of the picnic tables, a group of about six were sitting, which was very unusual. But they weren't into any mischief, so we left it alone. We made them move, and we realized after we did that what they were doing. Their six young minds were studying the Bible together. This was at 11 p.m. This was when the rest of them were out playing volleyball or doing something else or running wild somewhere else late at night. Six of them, we didn't ask them to. We didn't require it of them. Once again, another one who started when he was eight years old was leading a group of guys and girls in a Bible study. and Nobody asked him to. Tell ye your children of it. And let your children tell their children. And let your children tell another generation. Number two, we want to envelop friendship. I think the number one thing the Lord's body needs right now is Christian friendship. We've learned a statistic this year, which we never knew. I don't know that I like statistics. 
don't know how much we can trust in them or, or what they mean. But we learn that 40% of all children who go to Short Mountain for one week per year from 8 to 18 remain in the church. That's a higher statistic than those who attend Bible class on Sunday morning and Sunday night regularly. And I have my theory on it. It's Christian friendship. When you see 10 and 11 year old kids hugging each other and crying on Friday morning because they don't want to go home, not because they don't want to leave camp, they don't want to leave each other. When you see your 17 and 18 year old boys tear up because they don't want to go home either, you realize friendships have been built. And we could all leave this place tonight and never see each other again until next Sunday. That wouldn't be friendship. I believe that's something that we've enveloped at the camp. 1 Samuel 18, 1 talks about Jonathan and David. Remember, their souls were knit together. That's what we want to happen at camp. We want souls to be knit together. We want people to know that even though they're leaving, I believe we had five or six counties in Tennessee represented and I believe 20 or 30 different congregations. Even though we're leaving on Friday... Christians can survive, and Christian friendship can continue. There's a third thing in which I believe that camp's important. Number one, example. You know, adults are not perfect. We're just not. Never going to be in the sense of sinless, of never going to sin again, of never going to make a mistake again. We try to make sure those kids understand that Christians are Christians. If they're a Christian and I'm a Christian, we're equal in the sight of God and we all want to go to heaven together. And that's our main focus. It seems more and more we're divisive on that particular statement in the Lord's body. I put a phrase, and I meant for this to come up later, but it didn't work. They're not the future of the church, and we use that statement so often. I changed my theory on that this year. They are the church. They are. If they're Christians, they're the church. You and I are the church, and these individuals need more than anything to know they are the church. And we strive while we're there to make sure they know anything they need to know about what's going on. Our theme this year was heart and soil. We even printed on some applications, heart and soul. If I had to tell you what we were doing of the week, it was about the soul. If I had to give you a theme and I could, I could show you this book and I could show you everything that's in it and that really wouldn't explain what we were trying to accomplish because you can look at this. You can read these things. You can look through here and find the things they had to do. And you can see the things they had to read. This particular passage says, or this particular quote in the book starts off with the phrase, Is this you? It's talking about Bible camp and vacation Bible school and all sorts of things they can do. The main goal is about their soul. I know we don't think about an eight-year-old as a soul very often, do we? They have a soul. They may not know what right and wrong is yet, but we want them to be prepared when they are. Let's think about some data for the week, and then we'll tie the lesson all together, and the lesson will be yours for the evening. Baptisms. That's something that comes up every year, and at the end of the week, we have to go and report to the caretaker so the camp history can be kept written. Four boys and one girl, all of 13 years in age and above, two on one day and three on another, became a part of the church. Restorations, three, two of which were campers. One of those campers, Derek and I both, the other director, had been con conversating with him for a couple of weeks about some things we had been informed about. Finally, on Wednesday, he made that right with the Lord. That was the best part of the week. These eight little things made it worth it all. It takes a cost of about $6,000 to run a week of camp. And that's on a low budget like we try to do. And it was worth it all. I'd spend twice as much as that if we could get that number every year. 
Some years we have more, some years we have less. But there's the point we learned about camp. It's worth the soul. I don't have the statistic with me about how many had been baptized throughout the years or how many had done this or how many had done that. But what I know is it's worth the soul. I know this was just a brief introduction to something that you're quite vaguely unfamiliar with. But I want to give you a challenge. Stop and talk to Connor and Trevin and Bryce. Talk to Jim and Tabitha. Talk to the Glovers. Talk to Nathan about what that week has done. And I hope what you find is a spiritual atmosphere was created and great friendships were united and knowledge was imparted. Tonight, I, I don't know where your soul sits. And I know it's hard for us in times like this to be thinking about the invitation song that's going to be sung in just a moment. But I want to talk to you about your soul. And I want to ask you two questions. Number one, where is your soul going? Where is your soul going? We live different lives. Some of you work here, some of you work there, some work in, in county, some work out of county, some travel, some work at big facilities, some work at small. We live in homes. Some have small homes, some have big homes, some are fancy, some are simple. But there's something we all have in common. Everyone in this room has a soul. Where's your soul going? If the Lord were to come back right now, where would your soul go? Depending on your answer, I want to ask you this next question. Is there anything you could change? Is there anything you could change? Do you need to become a Christian? That's something you can change. Hearing the Word of God, believing it, repenting of your past sins, confessing that Jesus Christ is the Savior, the all in all, the Almighty, and being immersed in a watery grave to come in contact with His blood, to have your sins removed. Is that something you could change tonight? We watched five precious souls do that this week. And how sweet it would be if one more would become a child of God tonight. Maybe you need to make your life right with God because you are a Christian, but you've not been living Christ-like. Three times this week that happened. And here's what I want to tell you. All three of them came forward for different reasons. We live different lives. We work in different places. We live in different homes. And we have different struggles. But the thing that can unite us is we can make it right with the Lord. If you have a need tonight, why don't you come as together we stand and sing. When peace like a river.